Let us begin. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Wayne Budd. Thank you for joining us today for the final listening session by the Boston Police Task Force to hear feedback on our initial recommendations, which were released on September 10th after three months of community engagement, research, and deliberation. Before we get into this session, we'd like to go over the different language options available for this meeting and how you can participate. We will then introduce ourselves, give the charges of the task force, the initial recommendations offered by this body, and then turn it over to hear your feedback. What I'm going to do now is introduce each language individually, asking that the interpreter introduce themselves and explain how to dial in. We'll follow, we'll start with the Vietnamese interpreter. Would you identify and introduce yourself, please? Hello, my name is Lynn. I will be the Vietnamese interpreter today, along with my colleague, Carolina. Xin chào quý vị, cảm ơn quý vị đã tham dự vào buổi lắng nghe ý kiến hôm nay. Tôi tên là Linh, tôi và đồng nghiệp của tôi, bà Carolina, sẽ là người phiên dịch tiếng Việt của quý vị hôm nay. Nếu quý vị cần nghe bằng tiếng Việt, xin vui lòng gọi số 617-675-4444. Sau đó bấm mã số PIN 180-485-8888. Không sáu ba hai và bấm số thăng để lắng nghe buổi nói chuyện hôm nay bằng tiếng Việt. Xin cảm ơn. Thank you. Thank you. And with the Spanish interpreter introduce him or herself, please. Muy buenas tardes y bienvenidos a esta sesión de escuchar de el grupo operativo del Departamento de Policía de Boston. Eh, si necesitan interpretación al español, por favor, uh, Ponga el silencio en la sala principal y también en el de español es muy importante. Y llame al 617-675-4444 y el código de acceso 331-444-538-3030 y, y el símbolo de gato. Ok, ahí los espero. Gracias. And would the Haitian Creole interpreter please introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. My name is Samuel Mollis, the Haitian Creole interpreter. It's me and Estelle Paul. We're going to do the Haitian interpretation. And we're going to do the Haitian interpretation. And we're going to do the Haitian interpretation. And we're going to do the Haitian interpretation. Task Force Session 4 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 Thank you. Thank you. And with the Mandarin interpreter, introduce yourself, please. 大家好,我是Terry,然后我和魏会今天为你们提供普通话的翻译,然后如果你想要普通话的翻译,请拨打16176754试试试试,然后加上密码98486465加紧号键,谢谢,thank you. Thank you, and the Cantonese interpreter, introduce yourself, please. Sure. Um, Anna and Melissa will be your Cantonese interpreter for today. Uh, Anna and Melissa will be your Cantonese interpreter for today. Thank you. Thank you. And the Cape Verdean Creole interpreter, introduce yourself, please. Okay, Bertie and Creole interpreter, are you on mute? Hi, my name is Eva Rosa. Me and my colleague, Rachel Amado, we're going to do 
Cape Verdean o Cabo Verdeano. Uh, Senhores, uh, nós é, mi, minha nome é Eva Rosa, com meu colega Rachel Amado. Então, nós também a uh, interpreta na Cabo Verdeano. Se eu uh, conseguir entrar, vou poder uh, aquele evento principal ali. Vou poder chamar naquele número ali, 1617-675-444-2. Um, com acesso 84403-393-5619, com que assinar de pound. Por favor, obrigado. Thank you very much. I've been asked to advise that live captioning will be streamed sim simultaneously as a split screen to this session. On the right hand side of the screen, you will see a window to view the multimedia player, which will show the live captioning. Please click continue to view the live captioning. The ASL stream of this meeting can be accessed via Zoom platform. The meeting ID 989-5950-3312. Passcode 2 four seven eight three eight the web webex meeting will be screen shared in the zoom platform with no audio everyone joining this event as an attendee will have their microphone muted and you will not have the ability to turn your camera on if you are joining on a computer device at the bottom of your screen you have a menu that has different icons the microphone will be grayed out since you are muted as an attendee. If you can't hear, please click the phone icon and check to make sure your audio connection is set to speaker and microphone. To give testimony, please raise your hand or comment in chat. Host will unmute you. To raise your hand, open the participant information panel. Click the hand icon in the lower right corner. If you are connected by telephone, please press star three to raise your hand. You will hear two beeps when you are taken off of mute. At that point, you can begin your smoke, spoken testimony. Once your testimony is done, please click raise hand again to lower your hand. If you are joining by phone, please press star three to raise your hand. Please keep in mind that this meeting is being recorded and testimony will be shared with the task force. We encourage you to continue submitting written comments via the Google forms on the boston.gov slash police reform website until Friday, September 25th. That's this coming Friday. Now, to ensure all opinions are heard and respected, the decorum for these listening sessions are as follows. One, we ask that you engage respectfully at all times. Disruptive behavior will not be permitted. Two, when it is your turn to testify, you will be unmuted by the host. Spoken testimony will be limited to about two minutes per person at the discretion of the task force. And that's to allow as many people as possible to share their thoughts. But note, this is a listening session, not a Q&A, not a question and answer. We encourage you to submit additional written testimony via boston.gov slash police reform. So we're here to listen to you today, we the task force, and we look forward to your comments. Please be mindful of the pace of your spoken testimony so that it is that it is clear for the interpreter. And finally, again, these listening sessions will be recorded and made ab available to the public. Past listening sessions are on the city's YouTube channel and found on the task force webpage at boston.gov slash police reform. Now we're going to begin this listening session by introducing ourselves, giving you the charge of the task force and our initial recommendations. But before uh, we introduce ourselves, 
I'd simply like to say how proud I've been to serve as this chairman of the task force. It is certainly a dedicated group of community leaders and professionals who are hardworking, putting in countless hours to this effort. And it should be noted that each task force member has made significant contributions to the work product. I'm going to ask our task members to introduce themselves. We'll start with Mr. Feaster. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Joseph Feaster, I am chairman of the board of the Urban League of Eastern Massachusetts and an attorney here in Massachusetts. Thank you, Joseph. Our, uh, would Allison Cartwright introduce herself? Is Allison with us at the moment? Then we'll move on to. Yes, sorry, Mr. Chair. I was trying to unmute. Oh, Good okay, afternoon. Allison. Please introduce yourself to us. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Allison S. Cartwright. I am the attorney in charge of the Roxbury Defenders, and that is the public defender agency in Massachusetts, and we're located in Roxbury in Nubian Square. Pleased to be here and a pleasure to be a part of this task force. Thank you, Allison. Reverend Jeffrey Brown. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Reverend Jeffrey Brown. I am the associate pastor of the historic 12th Baptist Church in Roxbury. And it was an honor to serve on this task force with such great people and a very able chair in Wayne Budd. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend Jamal Crawford. Yes, uh, good afternoon. This is uh, Jamal Crawford, uh, community activist, uh, long time, uh, you know, concerned with police reform. Thanks. Thank you, Jamal. Sergeant Eddie Crispin of the Boston Police Department. Sergeant Crispin may not be with us at the moment. I am here, sir. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eddie Crispin. I am a 21 year veteran of the Boston Police Department and president of the Massachusetts Association of Minority Law Enforcement Officers. Thank you very much, Sergeant Javier Flores. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Javier Flores. Uh, I am uh, the office managing partner for Dinsmore and Shoal here in Boston and a Boston resident. And it has been a, a tremendous honor to serve on this task force. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Darren Howell. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Pleasure to see all the task force members as well. Pleasure to serve on this board. Uh, my name is Darren Howell, president of Drive Boston Community Resources, Inc. and political coordinator for 1199 SEIU Healthcare Team. Thank you, Darren. Uh, Attorney Marie St. Fleur. Hello, everyone. Marie St. Fleur. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Marie St. Fleur, former state rep. Proud resident of Dorchester, up in corner, and really has been a wonderful experience to work with um, the members of this task force and look forward um, to hearing from the community this afternoon. Thank you, Marie. Tanisha Sullivan Esquire, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon. I'm Tanisha Sullivan, president of the NAACP Boston branch, a resident of Hyde Park, and an attorney here in the Commonwealth. Thank you, Tanisha. And last but certainly not least, Superintendent Dennis White. Is the superintendent on? Is he on? Would he unmute if he? Well, Superintendent White has, is the chief of staff of the Boston Police Department and has been, as has the other task force members, a valuable contributor to our efforts. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, last June, Mayor Martin J. Walsh convened the Boston Police Task Force and charged it with reviewing four principal areas, uh, which were improving the body camera program, recommending rigorous implicit bias training for officers, reviewing poli Boston Police's use of force policies, 
strengthening the existing co-op board, and then added other areas, uh, which included to review the diversity and inclusion policies of the Boston Police Department, hiring and promotions at the Boston Police Department, and issues surrounding data collection and transparency. Those are the areas we were asked to review. Our initial recommendations were released on September 10th uh, to the mayor and made public at that time and we're seeking final public feedback. I wanna remind everybody that for us, the task force, this is a listening session. We wanna hear from you. We value your feedback. And this isn't, as I say earlier, this is not a Q&A. We want to hear your thoughts. Now I'm going to ask uh, certain of our task force members to speak about the areas on which they may have focused during the course of our work. And I'm gonna start out with the, the task that we had of strengthening the existing co-op board and ask attorney Tanisha Sullivan to take the lead on making a brief presentation on what went into that the, the recommendations. Tanisha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to ask um, as I speak if we could have the slide put up with the OPAT structure. Thank you so very much. Um, first, I want to uh, certainly acknowledge the other members of this subcommittee uh, who I had the distinct pleasure of working alongside Allison Cartwright, Jamal Crawford, and um, Joseph Feaster. Um, we served as the really kind of for the for the purposes of the task force, really, um, we served as the kind of the lead um, collectively in uh, in examining uh, what was uh, what is called the Community Ombudsman Oversight Panel and for helping the task force prepare um, what are our, our recommendations in this space. Um, most notably, I want to um, really make sure that folks understand that in addition to the listening sessions that we held, um, really seeking to hear from community on this particular topic, um, we also examined national models um, and, and had the opportunity to speak with um, other leaders in other cities who um, have various models of um, policing oversight um, ranging from similar panels like our own uh, all the way to uh, strong civilian review boards. We also examined very fully previous uh, recommendations coming out of, uh, co uh, out of the co-op um, and also had the opportunity to speak with both current and former members of the co-op. Um, in addition, we of course uh, engaged with advocates here in the city activists, uh, other experts, and really most importantly, um, families and community residents in order to um, come up with what we believe is one of the most robust um, recommendations as it relates to policing oversight to date. Um, it's important to note that this structure certainly does embrace recommendations that were made by um, former co-ops, um, specifically with respect to um, having an independent um, body uh, that is separate from the police department. Um, first and foremost, uh, the recommendation is that there be an Office of Policing Accountability and Transparency uh, set up uh, that would stand within uh, the mayor's office. Um, that uh, entity would have certainly um, the authority to investigate certain um, complaints that are coming from community as well as oversight um, of the in, internal, the work of the internal affairs um, division unit uh, in the Boston Police Department. Uh, this entity as a collective um, would have a subpoena power um, and also um, as recommended would really seek to um, create a structure that brings about not only greater uh, 
public accountability, but also public participation. Um, I do want to, before we open it up for um, comments or feedback, I do want to quickly um, review the structure. Hopefully um, folks are able to see it. For those who are on the phone, I'll describe it. Um, the Office of Policing Accountability and Transparency um, would be led by three commissioners. Um, those individuals would um, hold um, if you will, the subpoena power for all activity under this particular office. Um, there are three legs, if you will, uh, to this particular office. There's an administrative um, arm, which is which will be led by an executive director um, who will also have a staff um, to support this work. Um, that staff will that particular um, leg of the structure will be charged with a number of um, kind of the administrative or operational functions of the office, including the receipt um, and initial screening of complaints. But also, I think most notably, this particular leg would provide the direct support for investigations, independent investigations, um, and also would hold within it um, the responsibility for um, producing and releasing um, reports that we can talk about later if folks have questions. The second leg is what we call the Internal Affairs Oversight Panel. Uh, the old co-op, as it was called, um, was um, one of the things, one of the issues that was brought up with respect to the old, with respect to the co-op was really its authority and scope. Um, that being said, with this structure where we um, believe that we're addressing authority and scope, but we are also really putting a line in the sand and stating that um, having a body that is specifically responsible for oversight of internal affairs is critically important um, and must remain with the appropriate structures. Um, this particular leg would um, have the ability to, in, to review um, any and all um, internal affairs um, investigation determinations. The third leg, if you will, is, or branch, if you will, is the, I'm sorry, let me go back. Um, the internal affairs oversight panel will have five to seven members um, who, again, kind of will stand kind of independently. Its chair will serve as one of, it, uh, one of the three commissioners. The third leg is the civilian review board with nine to 11 members. Um, its chair would serve as one of the three commissioners as well. Within the, the, the scope um, of the civilian review board is really any complaint that would come from a member of the community um, related to the Boston Police Department. Here, I do want to call out um, that recommendation 1.01B indicates that the Civilian Review Board would have purview over a number of um, complaints that might relate to excessive use of force or deadly force, et cetera. I do want to make it clear that um, that we certainly recognize that the district attorney's office has the purview over um, cr any criminal aspects of those of, of those um, matters. Um, and this is in no way meant to step on that. But it is to say that there could be aspects of those types of complaints that are civil in nature and this body would have the ability um, working certainly alongside um, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, working in a way that does not interfere with any criminal investigation to review those matters. Um, again, within the report, we do have an exhaustive list of um, areas where the civilian review, review board may um, weigh in. I think one of, one of the things that I would like to amplify that is that this review board we also are recommending would have responsibility going forward for reviewing um, Boston Police Department current policies, um, just as we um, did through this particular um, this particular exercise, but also have the responsibility for reviewing any 
um, proposed policies of the Boston Police Department going forward using a racial equity lens. Um, this particular, the Civilian Review Board would also have the opportunity to provide, to convene community, to provide feedback um, to um, the, the city administration on the performance of the Boston Police Department writ large. Um, with that, I will stop. Uh, hopefully that provides enough of an overview for those who um, have not had an opportunity to fully review the, the report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Attorney Sullivan. And we'll next hear from Javier Flores and Marie St. Fleur, who are going to talk to us briefly about the bias, excuse me, implicit bias training as well as diversity and inclusion in related topics. Uh, as it comes to bear on the Boston Police Department. Javier and Marie. Are you unmuted, Javier, Marie? Sorry, I am unmuted now. Um, <laughs> my name is Javier Flores. I had the, uh, the honor of serving on the subgroup uh, along with Eddie Crispin and Marie St. LaFleur, addressing implicit bias training as well as hiring, promotion, uh, and, and retention uh, within the, the, the Boston Police Department. Uh, just kind of a, as a general overview, some of our objectives in, in looking at these issues were to uh, try to make changes to help foster a culture within the BPD that supports racial equity. Uh, both by improving training and ensuring that officers of color are represented at all levels of the organization in numbers that reflect uh, the community. Uh, additionally, um, we wanted to ensure that there are structures in place to ensure uh, equity and accountability throughout the organization. Uh, so overall, we, we've made uh, six recommendations uh, to be implemented. Uh, the first was the uh, creation of a BPD diversity and inclusion policy. Uh, currently, no such policy exists. Uh, we think that it's important culturally that there be a clear statement uh, reflecting the BPD's commitment to diversity and inclusion. Uh, that statement should address issues, um, you know, related to, well, first of all, it should provide uh, a, a statement of the commitment and include clear and transparent metrics that the BPD hopes to achieve. Uh, it should, it should uh, address the demographics of the, uh, the civilian employees, the officers, the cadet program, the academy. Uh, it should demonstrate a, a commitment to hiring and promotional equity, uh, and it should promote uh, increased diversity in the units and districts that most frequently interact with the largest minority populations throughout the city of Boston. The second recommendation was the formation of a diversity and inclusion unit uh, within the BPD that reports directly to the commissioner. Currently, while the BPD has a diversity recruitment officer and exam administrator, there is no DNI unit. Uh, the diversity recruitment officer doesn't have uh, an influence on matters related to promotion, discipline, culture, uh, or training. Uh, the DNI uh, unit. Uh, which would include the uh, a chief diversity officer and the uh, diversity recruitment officer, as well as any necessary staffing to uh, achieve its objectives, uh, would have a voice in matters related to hiring, recruitment, promotion, retention, uh, culture, training, and uh, BPD policies. The third recommendation is the creation of a BPS graduate preference. Uh, the, the graduate preference is to serve a, a number of objectives, uh, you know, in, in preparing our recommendations, we went out and spoke with, uh, you know, a number of experts, uh, people that are involved in racial literacy, anti racist and implicit bias trainings, people who are involved in addressing cultural issues, uh, specifically within police departments. We spoke with uh, individuals in police departments in, in other parts of the country and uh, other parts of Massachusetts. And then we spoke with officers within the BPD uh, to get an understanding of 
uh, of how those systems work and then what other people, what strategies they're affecting or imploring uh, to, to uh, that, that may be effective here. And one of the issues that uh, was expressed to us was the difficulty in, uh, you know, recruiting diverse officers into the BPD. Uh, we believe a BPS graduate preference would, would help address that issue uh, and, and also uh, create a, uh, a, a better relationship between officers and the community. Uh, BPS graduates uh, are individuals that are often longtime members of our community uh, and people that are, you know, have a, have a strong relationship with the community, uh, have a different approach to policing, and that's something that we feel could be beneficial. Uh, the BPS graduate preference would apply to individuals who have, who have graduated from uh, a BPS high school uh, or, uh, you know, participated in a, in a program, lived in, Massachusetts, in Boston and participated in a program uh, that allowed them the opportunity to graduate from from uh, another local high school in a, in a surrounding, uh, surrounding town. Uh, the fourth change is uh, amendment of the promotional protocol within the BPD. Um, we, we felt that the current protocol is overly reliant upon the promotional examination, which doesn't capture many of the most important skills that are associated with uh, leadership. Um, additionally, the examination has created numerous other problems which have uh, caused the infrequent administration. Uh, we suggest that the BPD hire a firm to perform a study on how to effectively evaluate promotional criteria and develop a fair and equitable system uh, that would place a greater emphasis upon service record, uh, have increased transparency, and reward the officers uh, who, through their service, have exhibited the most desirable traits and skills. Uh, our fifth recommendation is the update of the bias-free policing policy. Um, we believe that there should be a clear articulation of the commitment of command, civilian and sworn officers, sworn officers to bias-free policing. They should establish and communicate clear procedures that promote transparency and accountability, uh, as well as tactics that promote positive interactions with Boston and community members. Um, additionally, there needs to be a clarification of the current definition of what's considered biased policing, uh, which, which we don't believe is a, is a, a fair reflection of the term. Finally, we recommend overhauling training. Uh, currently, uh, the BPD provides a single training in the academy that's related to implicit bias, which is outdated and of insufficient duration. Uh, we believe that the BPD should be providing trainings both in the academy and to in-service uh, officers, uh, you know, at all levels of the BPD. Uh, that go far beyond uh, implicit bias training, including focusing on uh, racial equity and literacy, anti-racist training, and then workshops that are focused on emotional intelligence, communication, and conflict management, as well as uh, mechanisms to effectively implement all the skills that we are teaching our officers uh, and cadets uh, on, on how to utilize those techniques. Um, finally, you know, we, we have recommended that uh, there'd be a, a racial equity task force that is comprised of BPD officers at all levels uh, who can uh, really drive uh, the process of implementing the cultural uh, and uh, training changes that, we're, that we've discussed. Uh, you know, they would be involved in, in kind of monitoring the implementation of these, of these practices uh, and ensuring that their desired effectiveness is being achieved. Thank you. It was indeed a pleasure to work with um, Attorney Flores and Sergeant Crispin on this um, um, committee, um, at, on the subcommittee. And um, just for the audience to really understand what we were focused on um, were really the principles of transparency and accountability. Um, as we lift up um, the recommendations that you've just heard, we wanted to be certain that the view was not simply looking at the sworn force, but also civilians, um, because they're the way that they behave also have an impact on the way that policing is dispensed in this city. Um, we also wanted to be focused on changing the culture of the Boston um, police force, so, so that we're not simply involved in checking the box, but making certain that there's real uh, racial literacy um, happening in the trainings that would lead 
um, to real deep cultural changes um, and accountability. And so that accountability means that it would also be specific metrics that would be developed to make certain that where we are moving in the direction that we ought to be moving. At the end of it all, I mean, like anything else, you know, you know, it's, you know, we've all, the number of us who were attorneys, both present and those who were reformed, um, worked on this project and some of us who've worked in policy over the years. And so at the end of it all, if there's no accountability, then we know that it's not gonna be realized. And the bottom line is accountability also stems from the public continuing to remain vigilant and involved in how this moves forward. So again, thank you um, everybody who worked on this. Um, and, um, and I have to give the police officers who worked on this with us, um, they were open um, and to listening and to sharing. Um, how the system works internally. And we had a number of officers who are willing to come forward at the hearings to share with us their experiences, both good, bad, and ugly. And so we appreciated that as well as all the civilians who stepped up to share with us. For uh, that input, I'm next going to ask Reverend Jeffrey Brown if he would talk to us about two of the areas that uh, his subgroup undertook one of which was body worn cameras, the other of which state and federal funding to police departments, and in particular, the Boston Police Department. Reverend Brown. Actually, Brother Chair, are we uh, going to do the body worn cameras piece? Uh, if we're about to then um darren i think uh, if you could take the lead on the body worn cameras no problem uh good morning good afternoon again community um uh, i had the pleasure of working with reverend jeffrey brown and Attor uh, attorney uh, allison cartwright as the subcommittee to focus on the body worn camera policy recommendations um granted that there was extensive discussion when the policy was first introduced to the city of boston so we did not try to reinvent the wheel, but get some of the information from those that was involved in the initial discussion around this policy. So we reached out to uh, Segun Edu, uh, Shakia Scott of the Boston Police Camera Action Team, as well as Rashawn Hall of the ACLU, who had extensive insight and in, uh, working on the original policy um, that came out around the body-worn cameras. Uh, we have a few recommendations. One, the first recommendation had to do with activation. When are the uh, uh, cameras on? Uh, we recommended that the body worn camera program uh, to be ex expanded to include all uniform officers at Boston Police Department, as well as the cameras to be on at all times um, during work hours with the exception of pri that, that privacy allows. Um, the second recommendation had to do with uh, police officers reviewing the footage prior to them making uh, the incident report. It was recommended that the police officers uh, be prohibited in reviewing the footage um, prior to writing a police report. Um, the third recommendation was around uh, access and disclosure of the, uh, uh, the information from the body worn camera. Um, the recommendation is that access is allowed um, to the subject of the recording or next of kin and un, uh, unfiltered access to the footage. We want the raw footage as is. With all other FOIA, retention of the video should be at least six months or three years if flagged by the subject. So we wanna make sure, officer or supervisor, we wanna make sure that that um, footage has some type of shelf life that makes sense um, to be in place. Uh, the fourth, a uh, recommendation had to do with biometrics and facial recognition technology. Um, the recommendation is that we continue to support the banning of said technology from the body worn camera program. And the last recommendation had to do with discipline when policy is violated. It was recommended that the BPD uh, create some type of tiered approach as it relates to the disciplinary uh, practice so that officers are not accumulating multiple uh, infractions and violation and still uh, serving as a uniform officer. So those were the five recommendations that we had to enhance the current policy um, as it relates to the body worn camera program. And I'll let uh, 
Reverend Brown. Uh, nope. Do you have anything that might have been missing? Yep. No, you 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 were excellent. Uh, in terms of the federal and uh, state grants that would come into the Boston Police Department, we spoke to uh, Maria Cheevers and her deputy at the Boston Police Department, and they gave us a complete list of of all the grants that they have received and the reasons behind them. And ultimately, what we decided to do as a collective body is to fold the uh, oversight and and the advising around those grants into the um, hopefully newly created OPAT um, um, organization that um, uh, that um, that we've talked about earlier, and so so there will be some uh, larger community understanding as to what grants are coming in and where exactly are they going and some possible areas in which we can um, direct new grants. So that's it. And I thank everybody for listening. Brother Chair. Thank you very much. And last and certainly not least, we're gonna hear from Jamal Crawford and Joseph Feaster, who will be speaking to us about the use of force policies of the Boston Police Department, as well as data collection, all of which guided by principles of accountability, enforceability, and transparency. So Jamal, I'm gonna ask you to lead off and Joseph to chime in as you deem it appropriate. Jamal. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as everyone has said, uh, you know, working on this task force was definitely uh, an experience and we had some great minds here who put uh, their best foot forward in order to uh, look at as much information as possible so that we could come up with uh, what we're presenting to, to the, the city of Boston, which we think is, you know, moving in uh, the appropriate direction. Um, so it was a pleasure working with everybody, and, and I really hope that the public takes this opportunity to chime in fully. Um, I'm going to be as brief as possible because I really want to get to the public thing. And at this point, I'm really hoping that people have already dived into the original um, uh, draft release. But at the end of the day, um, we discovered very quickly that the, the BPD use of force policies in and of themselves were not necessarily the problem. The problem was uh, what happens if you violate those policies? So we tried to uh, deal with basically uh, appropriate measures of accountability and transparency, which dealt with a lot of reporting, and that's where the data is tied in. So to make sure that the BPD is required to report all the use of force data, right, including weapons, discharges, and so on and so forth, to all of the appropriate federal and state agencies. Uh, as it was happening before, there were some questions as to how or if that data was getting re reported appropriately. We want to make sure that that is shored up uh, uh, and that that is all reported appropriately. Secondly, uh, arrest-related deaths or the Deaths in Custody Reporting Program. That's another program of the federal government just to make sure that police departments are reporting all of this data that comes in. Um, we recommended that uh, the city and the BPD uh, should attempt to resolve all cases involving excessive force and wrongful death um, and release all data and records. Um, we also understood that there needed to be a, 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 some sort of development of zero tolerance policies. What would it take for someone to be completely removed from the force? Now, uh, the last thing that I'll, I'll, I'll say in that regard is, um, okay, pardon me, uh, to keep in, uh, to keep up to date, we want to make sure that these policies are constantly uh, under review. So once again, as we've emphasized in previous uh, uh, public statements, this is not the end all be all, but we tried to put something in there that says that these should be under periodic review to make sure that they're in compliance with not only the will of the people, but the most up to date, you know, policing methods based on the uh, best information that we have. Uh, domestic violence by BPD employees should be classified as excessive force. Uh, 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 
after use of force, excessive force, killing of civilian incidents, uh, officers should have a psychological evaluation and submit to drug alcohol tests. A lot of this is already happening, but we wanted to make sure that it was uh, included. And lastly, with that, included in the language of all policies, uh, really, we need to have something in there that really recognizes race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, youth, elderly, or national origin. Uh, oh, I'd probably also add in there language, if that's not in there as well. Yep, language. Um, so, so anything where these communities have been disproportionately impacted uh, by policing or over-policing or whatso whatsoever. And then lastly, the good news is that um, what we've also been talking about, and this is where I would love uh, either Mr. Feaster uh, uh, or uh, 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 Chief White to come in and talk about uh, uh, the dashboard, you know, Chief White more on the dashboard, Mr. Feaster, if any cleanup needs to be done here, um, but the dashboard that the Boston police is proposing, which will actually uh, give us, I think it'll uh, address, you know, 80, 85, 90, 95% of the issues that have been historically brought up by activists and so on and so forth. And I also want to emphasize the timeline. We also understood and agreed that timelines throughout the department had to be really identified, uh, met, and adhered to, whether that's a timeline on uh, a public records request or a Freedom of Information Act request from an advocacy agency or a lawyer or a private civilian, those need to be addressed in a timely manner. The 10 days that the state law allows and then any other additional time after that to address that issue, as well as civilian complaints, internal affairs, investigations, and so on, that we have to make sure that we're addressing all of these things, not only in a transparent manner, but also in a timely manner. So uh, that's basically it for me. Hopefully I covered all the important stuff uh, and I will leave it to any of my colleagues or anyone else who wants to chime in. Mr. Chair, should we move to public comment? I think, uh, VA. And ladies and gentlemen, we thought it was important to highlight aspects of the report. So, but now it's your turn to provide your observations and feedback. So we're gonna ask the host to uh, uh, put on our first participant from the public. Can we do that? As a reminder uh, to the public that's joining in, if you do want to provide public comment, please uh, raise your hand. If you are joining by phone, please hit star three uh, and I can unmute you. Rhoda Gibson, you're unmuted. Oh. That was quick. I didn't expect it so soon. Um, hi, um, I'm Rhoda Gibson. I'm co-founder of Mass Adapt. Um, and I'm pretty sure you guys have heard of the police department knows who we are. Um, I live in Malden and I'm a little concerned that um, I'm glad that Mayor Walsh has put this uh, task force together, but I'm also concerned about is the task force going to be reaching out to all the police departments in Massachusetts, or is it just um, is all of this just for the city of Boston? I'll, I'll respond to that, Ms. Gibson. So we were uh, convened by Mayor Walsh to review policies in given areas uh, with a, an eye toward reform in for Boston and for the Boston Police Department. Other communities I've noticed have been undertaking similar efforts. Uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, Needham, uh, and I believe one or two other communities. Perhaps it's something that you might consider uh, asking your city government to look into if you feel that there's a need for reform of the police department in your particular community. But we're focused just on Boston. 
I hope that responds to your inquiry. I'm unmuting uh, the next participant. Caller, you're unmuted. Is there anybody there? Perhaps we should go on to the next person, uh, Ms. Sharif. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think you're having camera issues. Your camera is off. Okay, we'll uh, see if we can fix that. Elizabeth Doyle. Ms. Doyle, please. Hi. Um, I'm trying to unmute. You're unmuted now, it appears. Great. So, my name is Elizabeth Doyle. I live in the Savin Hill neighborhood of Dorchester. Um, I read the uh, I read the report pretty uh, carefully. And first, I want to just take a second to thank all the the uh, task force members for doing this. Um, it's a um, it seems like an incredible amount of work in a short amount of time. So, thank you for that. Um, I will submit written comments as well because I know I only have a couple of minutes. But I wanted to say something about the. Just the, the importance of the OPAT and the independent reviews, but also um, from an administrative perspective, just that it needs to be resourced by the city. This this will not work unless there are it's a it's a great structure. I completely agree with the structure, but it's going to take some some resources to support that structure in a financial and administrative way. So I just wanted to make that point. Um, my other point is what I think. Um, well, I would say that one of my favorite parts of this, and that's, I guess it's a hard word to say favorites when you're talking about this issue, but is the connection with the, uh, the Boston public schools. I think that is really important in both from a recruitment perspective, but also for the extra points that that men and women will get um, on the exam. So I just wanted to underscore that as one of my, I think, a very salient point. Um, the other one I wanted to make was something that I thought might be missing from my perspective anyway, and that is um, we've been hearing a lot about other kinds of expertise that need to be added to the, the police department, whether it's by contract or as part of staff. And that is when they go out for calls, there's people who have expertise around domestic violence, um, people who have mental illness, substance abuse, and homelessness. Um, I don't know if any of you who um, Maybe Marie, you remember uh, I've worked in homelessness for the city of Boston for close to 20 years at DND, and I'm very close to that issue. Um, and I know that many, many calls from the, the police department and throughout the, not just in Boston, but throughout the country are to people who have ho who are homeless. So it just seems to me there needs to be some expertise, whether it's with another officer or another unit. Um, I think is really key in, in really de-escalating some of these issues that don't need to uh, to end up where we don't want them to be. Um, my last uh, really comment is a very tiny little administrative one, but as I read this, um, I thought it would be really useful to have like an acronym key <laughs> from the OPAT to other kinds of things. It was uh, I kept flipping back and forth um, to things, so I know that's a very tiny point, and I do have other issues that I would like to address, but I'll do do. Those by writing. Um, I hope the the writing, the written comments that you get are will be um, will be distributed uh, widely. And I, I thank you for this opportunity to give my feedback. Appreciate it. Thank you for that feedback, Ms. Doyle. Thank you very much. Uh, would the host put on the next uh, participant, please? As a reminder uh, to all uh, speakers, both task force um, and also uh, the public. Just please be mindful of the pace of your speech as we do have a uh, live interpretation happening uh, in seven languages. Uh, Katie Bond, you are unmuted. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, letting me give some comments. Uh, one of the previous speakers, a member of the task force, um, mentioned groups who are disproportionately affected by interactions with the police. But not included in that list is people with serious mental illness, and it should be, especially young men. And I actually did submit this comment in writing, but I'd like to read it. I am a family member of a young adult man with serious mental illness. I have needed to call the police on numerous occasions 
when he has been out of control and needed to be transported to the ER. The officers have generally been helpful and have done their best to calm the situation. However, there have been times when Boston residents with SMI have been shot and killed by BPD officers. I fear every day, every single day, that this will be the outcome for my family member. The initial report states there is a need to critically analyze the capabilities and the expertise of the BPD and determine where responsibilities can be shifted. The city and the BPD must assess the BPD's expertise and ability to handle its current responsibilities beyond law enforcement." Unquote. When police are called to a situation where a person with SMI is psychotic, hallucinating, or otherwise in crisis and not thinking clearly, they should be accompanied by highly trained individuals to help de-escalate so there will be less chance that force will be used. Police are asked to play many roles in their job. They may have some training about SMI, but they are not social workers or other professionals with extensive training. To this end, I urge the city and BPD to envision how we, as a city, can reimagine the response to people in crisis with SMI and to form multidiscipline, multidisciplinary crisis teams that will be required to respond. I don't want my loved one to be next. Thank you very much. Thank you for those comments. May the, would the post please uh, tune in our next participant. Jake Leadloff, you're unmuted. Hello, thank you all for your time on this effort and for taking our comments. Um, I read the report uh, or the proposed uh, recommendations. I think a great body of work and I salute you all for that effort. Um, I would like to bring up a few quick things. I also submitted some written testimony um, as well. Uh, one issue that I think needs to be weighed in on is, um, so in my community testimony that I submitted is the availability of other folks to join in on these conversations. I think um, the city of Boston, folks in the city of Boston, myself and others, uh, Jamal Crawford involved on the task force, other folks in the community, Darren Howell, um, many folks have put together uh, an effort to gather community input on this issue before the task force was tasked with this task. Um, so I would like the task force to consider that work and those efforts and the voices that have been gathered. Um, I submitted video testimony where we reached out to families who have had their loved ones killed by the police. Um, and so I think those those comments should also be submitted for the record. Um, uh, in terms of the data, the data transparency um, and the uh, diversity and inclusion offices, uh, I think those are an excellent addition to what the original scope of what you were looking at was. Um, I think those should be backed up uh, through some sort of a public accountabil accountability measure through the OPAT. So that that dashboard, however it is made publicly available, um, and those efforts to make sure that we recruit and reach out to um, a more diverse pool of applicants and promote them and and uh, you know, advance them through their careers as law in law enforcement. Um, I think those efforts should be uh, in some way connected to the oversight that the OPAT is providing for the citizens. Um, I think they should have a voice on those processes. Um, I think a lot of these ideas rest on the commissioner um, in, enacting enforcement on behalf of the people of Boston, basically serving as an internal check within the department against um you know perhaps union negotiation union negotiated policies or other forces forms of pushback that might come from within um i think to that end the commissioner and who that is that role that role should not just be a political appointment i think the people of boston should have an input an input onto that process um uh, deeper than just what is suggested in the OPAT of, you know, kind of weighing in. Um, and finally, I'd like to echo the, the comments of the last two uh, callers 
for uh, involving other trained professionals um, and removing some of the burden and responsibility of the BPD when it comes to issues of domestic violence, substance uh, issues, homelessness, uh, mental illness, etc. Thank you very much for those comments, and we will certainly take them into consideration. But we do very much appreciate your input and your your observations. Thank you, sir. Uh, who is our next caller? Caller twenty six. You're unmuted. Caller twenty six. Perhaps we should go on to the next person, uh, Ms. Sharif. So for the folks who are calling, if you press star three, uh, when you're unmuted, you should hear two beeps, um, the fact that you're unmuted. I'm gonna unmute. Uh, Jennifer Bannon next. Jennifer. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Jennifer Root Bannon, and uh, I lost my brother in February to um, deadly force by Boston police officers. So um, I'd like to see some more anti bias training with people with mental health disabilities and special needs. Um, also, uh, paying close attention to the hours that are being worked by these officers, and if they're working late night shifts. The next morning, uh, they could be tired and be more apt to reaching for their gun instead of de escalating. Um, I'd also like to, I'm thinking about body cam uh, recordings and cloud storage. Um, I wonder about the police logs and, you know, how that's transparent. Like, do they sign it out and put in a serial number and then it's, you know, logged back in? Um, and then, also, I think it's important to reach out to families who have lost someone that they love to police violence, um, just because there's parts of stories that you'll get to hear that um, that you might not have thought of. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments and your. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chair, this is this is Tanisha. Can I just ask for the with the last um, commenter for just clarification on the the police log recommendation? I'm not sure that I caught that in full. Okay, I can just say. Um, so what I'm th what I was thinking about are the body cams. So um, you know they get collected supposedly by a supervisor, but are those um, are the serial numbers double checked? from like a log, like do they log out their body cam and then they come back and they check to make sure it's the same serial number. And also I think I've, I've been thinking about like cloud storage. So that way, if you know anybody wants to um, uh, not have their body cam uh, found that 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 imagery would be up in a cloud. Thank you. Bezer, can you give us our next participant, please? Uh, if I could just say, Ms. Root, I'm sorry for your loss. God bless you and your family. Thank you, Jamal. Gert Thorne, you're unmuted. Yes. Um, hello, all of you. My name is Gert Thorne. I'm a member of the Genetic Plain Neighborhood Council. And we have a subcommittee that's been working on the review of your report, and we thank you all for it. Uh, several comments. We would suggest that all of the of all of the tasks that have to be accomplished by the review boards, whether it be of the police or civilian review board, need to have a time frame attached to them. A process can take no more than X amount of months, whatever the time frame is. It's been found that in most governmental practices, that really helps bring the issues to a, a close. The other one we want to just reemphasize is transparency. Uh, the problem with the existing boards, as you well know, it's like putting your hand in a black box in the movie Dune, where you have pain, but you have no idea where it's going. Police department can often respond in two years to a complaint, which is just not acceptable, and that you all know that. The other issue is that you should really make sure that 
when there are problems related behavior, there was some talk about evaluating how many times these things happen. I think we need to learn from just simple old everyday practice by civilian businesses, which is that you have X number of strikes and you're out. It doesn't matter. And I know this deals with union issues, but we need to just conform to the rest of the world. Police is not any special, any more special than any other governmental function. And quite honestly, what it relates to the city of Boston now should relate to the city of, uh, should relate to the police officers in the city of Boston. The last item is that we would like to make sure that all review boards are diverse, racially, gender, professionally, to make sure that it contains architects, laborers, educators, whatever the case is. I realize that your first phase of work right now was certainly weighted toward uh, lawyers. I think that's great because you need to study legal issues. However, as it moves along, you need to make sure that you become more diverse. I thank you otherwise for your efforts. They're highly appreciated. And thank you for your input, sir. Thank you very much. Ms. Sharif, who do we have next? We're going to unmute Paige. Hi folks, my name is Paige Sparks. I'm a Jamaica Plain resident. Um, I thank you for your time and effort in putting together these recommendations. I'm curious about how some of the police budget can be factored into these conversations in terms of how we are allocating our funds as a city um, and perhaps reallocating some of them to some of the, the expertise that the previous commenters have mentioned. Um, I think that some of these suggestions are great, uh, but I would not like to see more money be put towards the police budget, especially with the lack of oversight. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. And it is, I should say that it is an issue that the commission has taken into uh, consideration. And there's reference to that, as you know, in the report. Who is our next uh, participant, Ms. Sharif? Don Carlson. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, th th thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. As I understand the recommendations of the task force, they would require a substantive culture change in the Boston Police Department. Uh, the need for culture change is implicit uh, throughout the recommendations themselves. And in discussing implementation of the recommendations, the task force is explicit in stating that the city and the BPD must, quote, commit to internalizing the task force's recommendations. And they must, again, quote, develop a culture that prioritizes diversity, equity, and community engagement. I'm speaking here today because my experience tells me that culture change is vital for any of these recommendations to work. And because it is not clear to me that there's a full appreciation of what it really takes to change the BPD's culture. Now, culture change is never easy, especially if that culture is longstanding, pervasive, and deeply rooted. Even though I worked with the police for more than 10 years as chair of my local crime committee, I have no deep knowledge about the culture of the BPD, but I do have experience in guiding organizations through system-wide culture change. There are common elements in any culture change effort. It's important first to understand what is an organizational culture. It's a fuzzy term to many people. I define, I define culture with three words, beliefs, values, and norms. Beliefs are what people in the organization believe to be true. As in, I believe I'll be penalized or rewarded if I do this or that. Values are what people believe to be important. As in, the priority given to diversity, equity, and community engagement, to draw some words from the task force document. Norms are the informal understandings that govern the behavior of people in an organization, as in, what do I do when I see a person acting in a certain way or driving a certain way or speaking a certain way? Or what do I do when I see a colleague breaking the rules? 
I've worked with a range of organizations in several different countries to change their work cultures. Some basic actions are common across all of these change efforts. Uh, first off, a change has to be led from the top by a person who personally and visibly wants to change to happen and will see it through until it does happen. It takes perseverance. Secondly, uh, change leaders have to fully understand what they are dealing with. For example, they need to understand what is right and what is wrong with a culture. Any culture can have both positive and negative aspects. They can build on the positives and zero in on the negatives. They need to understand how pervasive the existing culture is across and up and down the organization, how deeply rooted it is, what causes it, and what continues to sustain it today. And they need to understand what forces will oppose the needed changes. Then and only then can they develop a change program that will work based on the positive aspects of the culture that exists today and on the strengths of the officers and the leaders who already reflect the culture that BPD needs to achieve. New structures, policies, rules, and procedures will not by themselves change the culture in any meaningful way in any tolerable span of time. I sincerely hope that whatever reforms are adopted are accompanied by a serious and thorough look at how to achieve the culture change that will be required to successfully implement these reforms. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Well, thank you, sir. And I'd, I'd ask whether or not, if you've reduced that to writing, if you would share that with us, being mindful that we ask for written comments by Friday. But uh, that would be good to have your your statement on record, uh, written rec your written statement on record. Thank you very much. I will send it today. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Sharif, our next participant. I'm going to unmute uh, caller 60. Caller, you are unmuted. It seemed like they jumped off the call. Okay. No additional raised hands at this moment. Are there any comments uh, from the task force members before we conclude our session? And I'd like to thank uh, all of those who participated in this public session today. Your comments are helpful, useful, and will be given consideration by the task force prior to our completing our report. We thank you for your involvement with us and your expression of appreciation of the efforts that we've made to date. I'm going to close, uh, call this uh, session to a, an adjournment. Thank Excuse you me, Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, this is Tanisha. Um, yeah. I just wanted to, um, just ask if perhaps we could give maybe just a couple of minutes in case folks are trying to get their thoughts together. I agree. There's a, there's a number of hands up. I saw a Teresa Rodriguez had her hand up. Well, then let's get them on. Teresa was just uh, working through your issue just to be able to connect to her audio. So I will unmute her. And just as a reminder, uh, there are hands up for folks who have speak, spoken previously, please hit raised hand again uh, if you've already been called on. Uh, so your hand is lowered. So you are unmuted. Hi, thank you for taking my comments. My name is Teresa Rodriguez. I am a school teacher and so I appreciate the preference you spoke about for graduates. I also have some former students that now go to charter schools. And so I'm wondering if you would consider public school graduates in Boston not just BPS graduates. Um, the second thing would be thinking about the dashboard. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to attend the first few minutes. I wasn't sure if that will include demographics of the specialized units, which from my understanding are occasionally more coveted spots and for which political poll or juice sometimes required. The next would be um, thinking about whether you'd be able to 
I've heard people say that when officers wear the band around their badge as they are mourning um, an officer who's been killed, it often covers the number of their badge. And I don't, I don't know that that's intentional at all, but I wonder if we would ever issue kind of nameplates just with the last name of officers so that if people couldn't see those, as I know there's no way to predict when uh, unfortunate events like that might happen, but just trying to think of ways to have officers be um, identifiable to the public without overly exposing them. Those are just three small things that I wanted to mention. I appreciate your help in all of your leadership in this regard. Thank you so much for your comments and, and your observations. There we have that. There is a caller uh, that I'm going to unmute and just because sometimes it's harder when I call out the caller number, uh, reminding this person it's a 617-359 uh, number. You are unmuted. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Claire Duffy. I work as a Boston police officer and I thank you for giving me just a minute. Um, I didn't really hear any of my colleagues speak prior to this. I currently work in the street outreach unit. Um, it's a new unit. We deal with those who suffer from mental uh, instability issues, substance abuse Hi. issues, and homelessness. I have to apologize. I have a toddler in the background. Um, forgive me. Um, I wanted to touch point on a couple of things that concern us deeply as a whole, but I wanted to say that most of and I would say almost everybody is open to more training. We'd be happy to be a part of anything that would make our structure better. Um, two things that two panelists are, or people that were speaking before me said, um, one just now regarding the morning dams, uh, we are, um, you know, we are mourning someone. So, you know, we weren't really thinking about covering IT numbers, um, but, we are mandated and we always are supposed to tell you who we are um, and maybe we can take into some consideration of putting numbers over that, but we are mandated to tell you who we are anytime we're asked, um, name and badge number. And regarding the woman prior whose family member was lost as a result of uh, sleep in February, we're very sorry for your loss. Um, and regarding her question to the body camera, we have to plug in our body cameras at the end of our shift, and it goes up into the cloud. Uh, we're assigned the same camera every single day with the same serial number with the same assignment on the cloud, um, and that's accessible to the public as far as I'm concerned uh, under the Freedom of Information Act. Um, the main concerns that my colleagues and I have are regarding the Civilian Review Board that would take away our right to due process under the implement, you know, your implementation of discipline. Um, we just would like to remind everybody that while we uphold everybody else's right to due process, that we should also be given that right um, during these ideas and police reform. Um, we also are very concerned about the fair investigative process message. Um, if there's not a fair, board, I'm very concerned that we would not have a good process um, properly investigating us. Um, we should be judged fairly and competently. Um, any board that oversees any complaint should have appropriate training regarding policing and must understand law enforcement. So hopefully somebody with a background or um, perhaps uh, a college degree um, that focuses on law enforcement. Um, or perhaps if we do have some people that have retired uh, that do this kind of focus work and they were on your panel um, with the city of Boston, I believe two weeks ago. Um, we'd also like um, to make sure that there's no availability to make false complaints against us. Uh, it's, it's, there is going to be a request for accountability and transparency from us. We would like to mirror that with our constituents. Um, that's all I have for now. And I really appreciate you taking the time to let me speak. Thank you very much, officer, for your for your comments. Thank you very much. 
Ms. Sharif? Are there any other hands up? So I don't see additional raised hands that weren't up in the past, uh, but just before you close out, just reminding folks, you can hit star three to raise your hand, or you can hit raise your hand under the participant icon if you're joining by computer, uh, if there are any last minute thoughts uh, that you would like the task force to consider. Thank you, Ms. Sharif. I'm gonna unmute uh, Jasmine. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. My name is Jasmine. I am a PhD student researcher um, studying issues of policing and race. And so um, definitely very um, important, um, but also just wanted to ask a question um, about the involvement of researchers and experts on this board. I know that earlier on there was discussion about consulting experts when coming up with this report, um, but I just wanted to um, gain further insight on their involvement throughout this process. And so maybe this somewhat speaks to the point that was raised by the officer right beforehand about um, impartiality on the review board. I mean, I don't know um, if that would necessarily um, be achieved with certain people on the board, but like with researchers, how are, what is the role of researchers and experts on this, on this committee moving forward? Uh, I, I'm not sure if you were on the, uh call uh, or on the uh, in the session earlier, but that was referenced. Um, the fact that we have consulted with any number of experts, uh, many of whom are acknowledged in the report. But I should also add on behalf of this, the task force that we do not believe that our that the report when it's in its final form and submitted to the mayor is the end of the type of work that the city needs to consider in terms of implementing uh, the recommendations and in terms of perhaps developing further uh, recommendations. So we have addressed that in, in the body of the report and you may note in the acknowledgements uh, folks who have been contacted for their expertise uh, and who have made contributions uh, to the report. Yes, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so I was actually um, trying to gauge after the report, right? So after this is done, like when it comes to these uh, these boards that are put in place, like what role will they have afterwards, whether it be actually serving on some of these committees? Like, so that's my question. Well, that's yet to be determined, to be to be frank with you. Uh, I don't know if uh, Tanisha or yeah. Allison or any, any of the other members of the task force want to further respond. Sure, I, I, I will. So with respect to the um, internal affairs oversight panel, um, the way these and the civilian review board current um, city charter does does give the the appointment authority to the mayor that's under our current uh, city charter. That being said, the recommendations is currently presented um, do speak to the mayor um, making his uh, his in this instance um, appointment from a pool nominated by, and there are a number of, um, uh, from community, um, uh, neighborhood associations, um, advocacy or organizations, a number of, um, what do we mention here? A number of kind of um, entities, both professional, community, and academic. Um, and for the Civilian Review Board, the recommendation is that um, their two um, nominees be selected from among, again, a pool that is nominated by um, kind of, again, community, advocacy, academic, professional um, entities and that the city council have an opportunity to make nominations as well. Um, ultimately, again, um, under current city charter, it is the it is within the final discretion of the mayor. Thank you, Tanisha. Thank you very much. 
uh, oh, if I could just add uh, the the last the last commenter, uh, if you have a team of people who are researchers and data collectors, I certainly want to be in contact with you. So if you could please somehow, uh, I don't know how we can, you know, get in contact on this public forum, but if you could see the spelling of my name, you could certainly find me on Facebook or what have you. I would love to be in contact with you because uh, data and research is, is, is much needed and a lost art. Yes, thank you so much. I'll definitely reach out. Thank you so much, Nisha, for your comment as well. Just one other thing. I think I think the city, this is Eddie Crispin, the city is going to be looking for individuals to staff uh, their research department. So uh, to the extent that you want to take part in the process and be one of those people who are at the forefront of like really pushing forth this dashboard, um, I think you can look at some point, I'm sure the city, the Boston Police Department will be uh, posting positions um, for researchers, et cetera. Thank you, Eddie. Ms. Sharif? I'm going to unmute uh, Latoya Gale. Latoya? Hi. Um, I, I, I don't know if, if I say if I want you guys to recommend, but what I'm concerned about is if the if people who are um, recommended for appointment only come from like a set of organizations that the mayor or city councilors have relationships with, I'm afraid that this will be business as usual because it will be the same organizations who 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 who, who government is always looking to for answers and not really from a pool of concerned citizens, um, is there a way to put in there that people can apply to be considered for a nomination and that those nominations don't only come from a curated group of organizations? Great recommendation, taking note of it. Thank you, Latoya. Thank you, Latoya. Ms. Sharif, do we have uh, any other callers or persons who would wish to participate? I'm not seeing any further raised hands. Are there any closing comments from uh, my colleagues on the task force? Sorry, Mr. Chairman, uh, there is one additional one that just popped up. Uh, last, last name is Alliance that's on there. Okay, let's hear from Hi. From the caller. Hello. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much for taking my last minute call, and also thank you um, for having this and and developing this initiative and moving it forward. I actually just found out about this today, so I'm a little bit behind with the whole uh, the movement in whole. So forgive me if I'm if I'm adding a recommendation or adding a comment that doesn't find specific place within this. Um, but basically from what I'm hearing, I also have a question and I'm wondering about um, what we are doing or how we are thinking about those already affected by improper policing, um, specifically those that are already incarcerated and are affected by um, the lack of training, the lack of guidance, the lack of accountability that our police force has had and what are we doing to ensure that they do not contribute to the recidivism rate once they are re-entered into society? How are we um, contributing to that conversation as far as if someone has felt um, that they were not um, properly given, you know, uh, their uh, process of due law, that they weren't properly given, uh, they didn't receive justice and they were, you know, incarcerated injusticely, um, how are we addressing those candidates? How are they able to express their concerns? And then therefore, how are we holding officers accountable for things of the quote unquote past, but are going to cert certainly affect people once they're re-entered into society and their lives are affected indefinitely. And then also, how are we, um, this, is, this is a comment that I don't know 
it may not have any bearing in this particular movement, but as far as jobs are concerned um, and police officers working beyond 40 hour weeks, how are we addressing like even detailed positions like construction positions? Why are these even being given to police officers and who in our community can actually take these roles on? You know, per, and I'm thinking particularly incarcerated loved ones because I have several at this moment who are going to have a very hard time finding gainful employment. And if we are going to redefine the relationship between those who are incarcerated, those who might be incarcerated, and those that incarcerate them, this is a, a good time to think about that relationship, how, how it evolves once people re-enter society. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I'm not so sure how we would come to answer that other than uh, it is a bit beyond the pale of what we have been asked to do uh, by the mayor, but your, your, the questions are fair ones and it's something that we can give some consideration to as we wind up our uh, duties as a task force. So thank you very much. The last raised hand that I see is uh, caller 64. It's a 781-299 number. You're unmuted. Oh, hi. How are you? I'm sorry. I'm using someone else's phone. Um, this is Brenda James. I'm calling in. And I missed, unfortunately, I missed um, most of what, what was said. So is this going to be, get, um, is this going to be in a report after, uh, shortly thereafter? Is what going to be in the report, ma'am? Is the entire session and, and what was discussed, is that going to be in a report? It's all being recorded, and I believe it will be available to the public, yes. Am I correct okay. on that, uh, Ms. Jury? It will be uh, posted on the city's website, boston.gov slash police reform. It's also going to go on YouTube. Okay. Are you still able to submit um, any comments based on what, what whatever is published at, if you haven't participated in this part of the process? Uh, we, we are open to receiving uh, written comments until Friday okay. the 25th. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for calling in and participating. You're welcome. Ms. Sharif? I don't see any new raised hands. Uh, task force members, any comments as we wind down? And I thank everybody for their participation today and for engaging in this discussion with us. Community participation, as we said at the outset, is a key component to what we're doing. And as a reminder, as I mentioned just a moment ago, we're going to continue to accept written comments until this Friday, the 25th. So please send your comments via boston.gov slash police reform. So after holding this public listening session and engaging the community, we will now submit our, our final recommendation for reforms to the mayor and the final recommendations will be translated and available to the public in early October. I believe that concludes our session. Thank you again. Thank you all for participating and thank you to the mayor's staff for hosting us this afternoon. And of course, thank you to my colleagues on the task force. Good day, everybody. Have a good evening.